And uh, after 9-11, we realized that uh, as much as we live in the, the safest, the most beautiful country and, and freest country on the planet, uh, they're, they're going to come here, the radicals. They're going to attack us because we are a threat to the theocrats of Islam and, and those who are afraid of freedom. And uh, ultimately, I felt that uh, we as Muslims are the only ones that can repair the problems within our house of Islam. And thus, history will show that either we stayed asleep, uh, like many of the Germans did in, uh, when Nazism rose, or uh, we woke up and, and pushed back against the fascists, uh, of the theocratic fascists of Islamofascism, if you will. And I felt that I had an obligation to do that, things that you can do in this country that you just can't do elsewhere across the Middle East. And, you know, ultimately, it's about religious freedom, uh, whether it's the women uh, uh, insisting that they aren't going to be forced by misogynistic men to wear a hijab in Iran or elsewhere, or those of us who, who uh, reject uh, the interpretations of Sharia that are pushed on us sometimes within countries like America, within our own faith communities, to the uh, ignorance of many around us that don't realize what's happening. So we have an obligation, I think, to treat the disease. And the disease, as we believe it, is not terrorism, that's a symptom, but rather political Islam. Let me put a historical context. Set aside whether you know anything about Islam. America was developed as a country, as an idea, that people came here to escape the establishment of the church through government. And that concept is actually what we're trying to do in Islam. And I believe is what, it's not only an enlightenment where you have classical liberal ideas, but actually to defeat the, the root cause, which is the Islamic state. So when you have a state identity that's wedded to a single faith, then the legal system becomes that faith's tradition. So is the Quran a source or the source of Islam, of the law? So at the end of the day, if you believe it's a source, you can live in America and, and, and be very patriotic and if you believe it's the source of law and nothing else, then you're a separatist and you're actually an insurgent threat to the legal system that is the social contract of America. And that's why our organization is founded on the belief that we want to put an end to the concept of the Islamic State, no different than old theocratic states uh, uh, did not survive revolutions in the West. We want to put an end to the concept of military jihad. We want to put an end to the concept of caliphism and caliphates, that whole concept of Islamic supremacism globally. And ultimately, you know, blasphemy laws uh, and a lot of these other things stem from the concept of the Islamic State. And until the West understands that, we will never be safe from radical Islam, political Islam, and jihadists. I mean, this is essentially, you haven't said the word, but this is the distinction between Islam and Islamism. Right. Right. Islamism is basically what these political movements are. And I think that's one of the successes our work at the Muslim Reform Movement and our American Islamic Forum for Democracy has had in the past 21 years since 9-11 is that Islamists initially, they tried to say, tell the West, oh, don't use that term, it offends us, it means terrorist. It doesn't mean terrorist. In Arabic, it's Islamiyin, which are political movements animated and, and inspired by Islamic interpretations. So the Muslim Brotherhood is an Islamist movement. Hamas, an outgrowth of the, Isl of the Muslim Brotherhood, is an Islamist movement. Jamaat Islamiyya in Pakistan, one of the largest parties in Pakistan, is an Islamist movement. Iran's Khomeinists, even though it's the Shia variety of what I just gave you, or Sunni varieties, is an Islamist movement. So they are a party whose platform is based on theologians that put into place Islamic interpretations of Sharia or Islamic law. They believe that the flag is not a national identity based on all diverse citizens, but rather a national identity based on Islamic law and Islamic identity. So ultimately, we have to defeat that concept. American Muslims, I think, are uniquely positioned to say, you know what? We believe in a national identity that gives us religious freedom, is based in principles of morality and, and human rights that are derived from God, but not from a single faith. It's derived from a Western tradition of, of freedom of religion, Judeo-Christian history, and a, a liberty that separates from the theocratic uh, oppression. Islam is still pre-modern in its interpretation. It hasn't gone through a recognition that you protect 
the community by protecting the individual. It's still very tribal in its sense. And the radicalism in Islamist ideology legitimizes female genital mutilation, uh, in which they, they say a woman is born hypersexual, so therefore she has to have some type of surgical procedure done to her genitalia, which the uh, UN Human Rights Report identifies tens of millions that are done. It's horrific, and it's still a crime against humanity. We're trying to work with courageous organizations like the AHA Foundation and others to try to expose that in America, let alone globally. So they legitimize that. They legitimize honor killings against women that might decide to date or not wear the hijab or others where their uncles, their brothers have them offed from their family and they're just given a slap on the wrist for committing an act of murder in the West sometimes, let alone in Jordan or other Middle Eastern countries. So as you diversify discussion of the Muslim condition, you know, and the Muslim faith, you will actually then allow it, bring us dragging, kicking and screaming into the 21st century. Well, so this is the perfect moment, I think, to start talking about what's actually happening in Iran. Because it, it looks like there are people, notably, you know, in response to a woman who, I, I, I don't know if it's proven now that she was, you know, killed for her, you know, I guess opposition to exactly mm -hmm. the kind of thing that you're talking about right now. Um, is, is that what's happening there right now? There have been three basically uh, uh, upticks in, in revolutionary activity by the people since 2009. And in Iran, there's a complete confluence between the, the military, the government apparatus, and the religious apparatus, which are completely unified in Iran. So it is a theocratic state. And initially, there was the Green Revolution, which was basically an economic pushback by the workers in Tehran and in the larger cities, especially in, in 2009. Um, the Obama administration slept on that for a few weeks until they basically were pushed globally into doing something. And they slowly began to provide, you know, at least insist that companies help the revolution because the government at the time, just like they're doing now, turned off the Internet and did other things. Then sort of went quiet, even through the Arab awakening, because most of the people that started the revolution in 09 were tortured, put in the worst prisons in Iran and uh, I'll remind folks that Iran is the same regime whose best friend is Bashar Assad, who used chemical weapons, who has basically uh, destroyed and killed hundreds of thousands over the past uh, eight or nine years since the Syrian revolution, uh, 10 years now since the Syrian revolution took place. So Syria is a client state of Iran. Bring you to 2019, during the Trump administration, there was another mass movement of people into the streets of Iran. And at that time, I think the Trump administration was vindicated that, that the, the uh, uh, strong pressure against the Iranian regime against any type of nuclear agreement actually then fueled the people to feel that they had support in the West. And what was different about that revolution was it wasn't just economic in big cities. It was actually in all of the cities in which the theocrats, the clerics, have universities in Qom and other smaller cities that have universities based in what infuses the ideology of the regime, the Islamic Supreme Council of Iran. Now comes the women's movement, which is now taken off. No different than the Tunisia revolution was started by that one individual that had his cart that set himself on fire. This uh, uh, hero, uh, Masi Amini, uh, basically took off her hijab, decided she was not going to wear it, and she was tortured and killed. And it just set off a stream of demonstrations and defense. And what I think is really amazing about this, about this movement is that it's men and women. Nowhere else in the Middle East have you seen this. Usually when it's women demonstrating in Saudi Arabia elsewhere, it's just women. It's not support of the, the, the patriarchal culture also. And you're seeing this in Iran, which I think is also more chipping away at the almost 40 plus year entrenchment of the Islamic regime. And I think ultimately in the Middle East, you've had two choices. Tribal monarchical dictatorship, a military regime, which are secular socialist fascists, which are Ba'athists in Syria and Iraq, or, you know, in Iran, it was the, the Shah uh, and in Saudi, it's the, the king. And then that switched to Islamic regimes, two extremes, perhaps drinking from the same type of ideology, which is political Islam. One is top down, the other is bottom up.